we return for the second lecture covering uh, this disease of malignant sadness, depression, major clinical depression. And the previous lecture covered a number of things worth reviewing here. The first is emphasizing what an awful disease it is. 15% of us or so will have a major depression at some point in our lives, one of the leading causes of disability on the planet, and a paralyzing disease at an extreme. We saw something about the symptoms, most defining. It is a symptom, it is a disease of lack of pleasure, anhedonia. Then elements of grief, of guilt, elements of what is termed psychomotor retardation. Everything is exhausting to do, to think. The possibilities of self-injury, those vegetative symptoms, including elevated glucocorticoid levels, and that really key point that comes out of vegetative symptomology in this disease it's a disease. There are biological problems. This is not, oh, stop babying yourself. What we then shifted to is looking at some of the actual biology of the disease. And we started off with the neurochemistry, the famed neuropinephrine hypothesis of depression, and how in the years since it's given way to recognizing, yes, too little neuropinephrine plays a role, likewise dopamine, likewise serotonin, interactions amongst them, and I would bet the farm that there's going to be a gazillion more neurotransmitters that are implicated. Then transitioning to structural features of the brain. And that key role played by the cortex, this area of the frontal cortex, the anterior cingulate, this part of the brain where you think abstract sad thoughts and, in effect, get the rest of the brain to go along with it as if it were an actual stressor. So now we transition over to another piece of the biology story. What do hormones have to do with depression? And turns out a whole lot, not surprisingly. First realm of this. First realm is one that almost immediately comes to mind when you think about hormones and depression, which is the simple question, why do women have much higher rates of depression than men do? Now, there's two different types of depression. There's what's called unipolar depression, which is you alternate between being depressed and not depressed, depressed and not depressed. Then there's the much rarer, in some ways more disastrous, bipolar depression, manic depression, where you're oscillating around the extremes. Men and women have the same rates of bipolar. Women have roughly twice as much uh, diagnoses of unipolar depression. So what's that about? All sorts of possibilities, all sorts of theories. One is the diagnostic criterion problem, which goes as follows. Men, when depressed, are more likely than women to self-medicate themselves with alcohol, with various drugs, and they're more likely to get labeled as an alcoholic than as a depressive. They're not, there's not actually a difference between men and women. It's just that a lot of the men get categorized in another way. Some evidence for this, not huge amounts. Next explanation for why, legitimately, women have higher rates of unipolar depression is a very sociological, almost anthropological one. As we know by now, lack of control plays a huge role in stress. And in this view, there's a focusing on the fact that in so many cultures across this planet, women traditionally have less control over their lives. And in this theory, it is setting up one more readily for depression. Another realm, another realm, and this one has to do with sort of emotional, psychological aspects, what people do with upsetting emotions. And the tendency that women are more likely than men on the average, that women are more likely than men to ruminate on disturbing problems. What do I mean by ruminate? And this is a realm where you do studies which, like, they're so embarrassing how cliched the results are, but how consistently they come out. You take someone who's just had an upsetting interaction with a friend, something like that, and you give them a choice of some things to do afterwards, certain questionnaire to fill out. And a huge percentage of women choose to fill out a questionnaire about the nature of their friendship, the person they just had the argument with, when they met, does the person have a good marriage, all that stuff. And like a huge percentage of men choose to fill out some questionnaire, like trivia questions about the American presidency. 
No wonder these guys are such a mess. They can't communicate. They hide their emotions. On the average, once again, with obvious exceptions, on the average, women ruminate more on emotions, adverse emotions, than men do. That's pretty clear. What's much less clear is how rumination gets you into a higher rate of clinical depression. So all these sorts of possibilities, misdiagnosis, sociological explanations, emotive, communicative ones, for my money, the most interesting realm is what do hormones have to do with depression? And what do hormones have to do with the predominance of depression in women? Now, part of what makes this very interesting, makes the sort of endocrine explanation very compelling to me, is it's not only the case that on the average women have higher rates of depression than men do, but the risk of depression in women tends to peak at certain times in life, certain times in one's life history, shortly after giving birth. The two weeks after birth, the postpartum period, is the most vulnerable time of life for a human to fall into a depression around the time of menopause, around the time of one's period, all of these are circumstances where there's very dramatic changes in levels of certain hormones. And you know by now what some of the most pertinent ones are. Estrogen, progesterone, this is a realm where each has a lot of effects on the brain, remarkably where the ratio of the two have a lot of effects. And what we saw previously was all of these reproductive events from ovulation, menses, menopause, birth, involve enormous fluctuations in the levels of estrogen and progesterone, and thus potentially enormous fluctuations in the ratio of the two. And there's lots of reasons in my mind to think that abnormalities in levels of estrogen, levels of progesterone, levels of their ratio, levels of receptors for these in the brain may have something to do with this predominance of depression in women. And at this point, what's known is whatever your favorite theory is about the neurochemistry of depression, if you're a serotonin fan, if you're a dopamine one, if you're a neuropinephrine, whichever one you are buying into, there's precedent for how estrogen and progesterone affects some aspect of that system. So that's the first hormone that's relevant. Next one that comes in, thyroid hormone. Thyroid hormone, extremely interesting. Because what you see is thyroid hormone coming out of your thyroid gland, brain pituitary, what it plays a large role in is maintaining your metabolic rate. And what you see is when people become hypothyroid, a real drop in their levels of thyroid hormone in their metabolism, there's a greatly increased risk of falling into a depression. And in fact, what the numbers suggest is something like 15, 20% of depressions out there are in fact not due to a primary depressive disorder, but are instead secondary to an undiagnosed hypothyroidism. So what we see here is this very important point, which should be obvious by now. You can't separate the brain from metabolism, from nutrition, intertwining of all of them. Now, for our purposes here, in this course in general, obviously, the endocrine world that's most interesting with respect to depression is stress hormones, glucocorticoids. And as we've heard already, emit a tendency, somewhat of a tendency, for elevated sympathetic nervous system tone in people with depression. There is a very reliable increase in glucocorticoid levels in about half of depressives and the ones with the most serious cases. So suddenly we get pulled in explicitly for the first time something about the interactions between stress and depression. So what's the evidence to think there's even a link for this? The first is epidemiological. People who have just had major stressful events are now statistically more likely to fall into a depression. That's simply the pattern that you see. You see it with an interesting subtlety which is, suppose you have somebody who has some awful, stressful event happen to them, and they fall into a depression, and they come out the other end. This person is no more at risk now for a subsequent depression than anybody else is. A second trauma comes along. They fall into a depression the second time. They recover. They come out the other end. They're still no more at risk for a subsequent depression. 
somewhere around the fourth or fifth round of this, something happens and some endogenous process begins to take place and the person's depressions begin to cycle rhythmically independent of whether something stressful occurs in the outside world. Enormously important to understand this transition. So epidemiologically, stressors are associated with increased risk of early stage depression. More evidence. People who are given very high levels of synthetic glucocorticoids for their autoimmune disorder, their inflammatory issues there, not only is there the possibility of the memory problems we've heard about, but you greatly increase the risk of somebody going into a depression. Early stage of treatment with steroids, corticosteroids, people tend to have a euphoria, be in this energized state, very long-term treatment, increased risk of depression. Back to Cushing's syndrome. Cushing's disease, any of a number of tumors where the result is you are secreting enormous amounts of glucocorticoids and Cushing's disease carries an increased risk of depression. Okay, possible confound here. Well, duh, of course you get depressed. You've got this awful endocrine disorder. What are the appropriate controls in studies like these? People who have equally severe disorders, but ones that happen not to involve an elevated glucocorticoids, and the Cushingoid folks have the higher levels of rates of depression. Now, all of this evidence linking glucocorticoids, elevated glucocorticoids to depression, has given rise to a fascinating potential new realm of depression therapeutics. As mentioned earlier, there are drugs that target the norepinephrine system, the dopamine system, serotonin, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. There's drugs that are being tried that target some of the neurochemistry of pain, remarkably, and may can decrease depression, psychic pain, using some of the same pathways as physical pain, all these different therapeutics. A new one that's emerging is the notion of knock down glucocorticoid levels, decrease glucocorticoid signaling, and maybe that will work as an antidepressant. And Alan Schatzberg, psychiatrist at Stanford University, has been pioneering some of the work of using these anti-glucocorticoids. Some decrease the release of glucocorticoids, others block glucocorticoid receptors. The net result is less glucocorticoid signaling. And when you look at depressives with some of the most extreme versions of psychotic depression, with some of the most dramatic elevations of glucocorticoid levels, anti-glucocorticoid therapy appears to be helpful and therapeutic. So we see here glucocorticoids intertwined pharmacologically, therapeutically, epidemiologically. So of course the question becomes, how does an excess of glucocorticoids set you up for a depression? And we've seen umpteen different things that glucocorticoids do. Amid the possible candidates, one is extremely interesting, which is truly sustained stress and truly sustained exposure to elevated glucocorticoid levels deplete dopamine from that dopamine reward pathway. And this is a direct possible link between major stress and the emergence of the anhedonia, the absence of pleasure, typical of major depression. This is a really important link. So commensurate with all of this, you wind up seeing elevated levels of glucocorticoids in a substantial subset of depressives. It can take the form of disappearing the daily rhythm, the circadian rhythm of glucocorticoid levels. The levels don't go down at the time of day they normally do. Other versions are the glucocorticoid system has trouble turning off at the end of stressors. It doesn't sense a negative feedback signal, that sort of minutia we talked about before. Elevated levels of glucocorticoids. And this supports this picture amid the psychomotor retardation. You can't get out of bed. You're so wiped out. You can't get out of bed because an enormous battle is going on internally. This notion of a depression as a chronic stress state, the notion as we will see again, the notion of depression as anger turned inward. Okay, at this point, so you got something or other about the neurochemistry, you got something about the brain structure, you've got something about the endocrinology. At this point, you are practically a card-carrying biological psychiatrist at the cutting edge, the best there is out there. And at this point, if all you know about is the brain chemistry and the structure and the hormones, 
you're not going to be very good at curing depression. There's still going to be oceans of depressives out there who are not being helped. And to begin to put the pieces together, what we now have to do is transition from depression as a neurochemical, neuroanatomical, neuroendocrine disorder to looking at the psychological aspects of depression. And to begin to do so, God help me, very, very deep apologies here at this point, but I actually have to mention the name of Sigmund Freud. Because Freud had some remarkably insightful things to say about depression. Freud started off with the same puzzle we had in the last lecture. Hey, all of us get depressed, bad things happen to us, and we feel depressed and we heal. We come out the other end of it, and then there's the folks who bad things happen to, or even no bad things, and they crash into a deep clinical depression. Turn of the century Viennese term, mourning, something bad happens, you mourn and you come out the other end. Melancholia, something happens and you crash into a depression. And in this classic essay, Freud wrestled with the issue of what's the difference between mourning and melancholia, a reactive transient depression and a hugely impacting clinical one. And here's the scenario that he came up with, classically Freudian, with all of its possible things to criticize, but there is a kernel that just feels right in there. Okay, the core of Freudian thinking is individuals, objects, whatever, who you love, you also hate, ambivalence, confused feelings. In this Freudian view, depression comes out of a circumstance where you lose a loved object, person, idea, principle, who knows what, but you lose something, someone who you loved, and of course with the Freudian baggage coming along, who you also hated, and all that ambivalency stuff. What he posited was, in the aftermath of this loss, if you were able to put the angers, the hatreds, the resentments aside and focus purely on the sadness, the love, the loss, that's when you get mourning. That's where there's the sadness, the depression, and you recover, you heal, and you come out the other side. In the Freudian view, instead what's going on in melancholia You have these mixed feelings, the love, the hate, and you can't put the hate aside, and you are absolutely awash in the contradictions of the love, the hate, and the sheer force, the sheer crushing weight of this is what pushes somebody into melancholia. Okay, this isn't terribly scientific in modern terms, but something just feels right about this. When you look at this, no wonder there's so much grief. You lose a loved object, a loved individual, and you are able to put aside the ambivalencies, and you suffer one type of loss. You've lost this individual who you love. You have the mixed ambivalent state of Freudian confusion, and you lose a loved object, and you mourn two things. The first is the loss of that individual you love, and in addition, you have now lost the chance to ever make things better with them, to say the things you always wanted to, to hear them say or do whatever. It's a double loss. No wonder the grief is so much more severe. Next, the guilt. The guilt makes sense as well which is you're sitting there in this Freudian froth there of ambivalency and you love this person and you're sad and you miss them. And at the same time, there's a part of you saying, thank God I can finally live my life now. (gasps) How could you think a thing like that at a time like this? Guilt, paralyzing guilt coming in. More of the Freudian symptoms that begin to make sense, that psychomotor retardation, you are in the middle of this enormous emotional battle. You have this individual who you loved, you hated, you had mixed feelings, you wanted to say this and you never got to and you wished they could have told you this and you wondered if they really felt this way and you just want, and now they're gone and all you can do is take all that confusion and turn it inward and no wonder you're too tired to get out of bed for weeks on end, this is where that Freudian soundbite of anger turned inward begins to make a lot of sense. So you see all these pieces, including at the extreme, the possibility of anger turned inward taking the form of self-injury. So this was the classic Freudian view. It doesn't make any sense in terms of modern biology. There's no way you can turn ratios of love-hate ratios to translate into estrogen-progesterone ratios or what ambivalencies look like in terms of neuropinephrine. You can't do modern science on it. 
The best you can do is just have this intuitive sense, it just feels right. Nonetheless, that's about all you can do with it. So what sort of psychology winds up being much more pertinent? And this is where we switch over to the world of psychological stressors. We already know by now what the key building blocks are, lack of outlets, lack of control, lack of predictability, perception that things are working, worsening lack of social support. What a depression is about, in a sense, is a pathological extreme of those perceptions. And here's what you would see. A very disturbing research model with animals, but one, again, as you hear this, keep in mind, this is where Prozac came from. This is where tricyclics came from. This is where the next generation of antidepressants to treat the oceans of treatment-resistant depressives are going to come from. Here's the sort of model that's used. You take a rat, and you give it a shock every now and then. But it's set up in this contingent way where there's one side of the cage where the shocks come, the other side, the shocks don't come. And a little light comes on whenever there's going to be a shock here. And very quickly, the rat learns to shift over to this side. And the shock comes on this side, and the rat shifts over to that side. It masters this task fairly easily. Now, instead, take a rat where you just shock it. You just shock it without a warning, without any of this possibility of control. It just gets a lot of shocks. And now the next day, you put it into this setting where the light goes on here, you step over here and you find the light goes on here, you learn to step over here, and the rat cannot learn to do it. It cannot learn this simple operancy, this simple bit of efficacy, this simple bit of control, because what have you done? The day before, with those repeated uncontrollable shocks, you've taught that rat to be helpless. And thus the soundbite in this realm of learned helplessness. And when you do this to animals like these experimentally, suddenly they get elevated glucocorticoid levels. Suddenly they've got problems with levels of norepinephrine, dopamine, all of that. Suddenly you have an animal who could be made less learned helpless with some antidepressant drugs. And what this has given rise to is this notion in cognitive psychology that what depression is, is learned helplessness. And this fits as well. This even begins to explain one of the pieces of the picture of depression, which is you have a child who loses a parent to death at a fairly early age, and for the rest of their life, they are more at risk for depression. This makes perfect sense. Think about this rat. The rat has learned when I'm in this cage and I'm getting those repeated shocks, there's nothing I can do about it. That's what the rat should have learned. Instead, what it learns is when I'm in any setting, even a setting where I could do something to seize control, even in a setting like that, I don't do it. I can't learn it. I don't perceive it because I've overgeneralized my helplessness into a cognitive distortion. What's going on with a kid? An awful lot of childhood is about learning what things you can control, what things you can't in the world out there, and what happens when you learn not only that there's things that you can't control, but some of them are so, so awful, you begin to learn in an overgeneralized way that you don't have a whole lot of control over anything. And what you're setting somebody up for is that same overgeneralization process, that cognitive distortion where instead of learning, this is a setting where I have no control, no predictability, no outlets. Instead, this is what life is like. I am hopeless and I am helpless. This is a very powerful model. And this is one that I think gives us the most insight into the psychology of depression it's the lecture on the psychology of stress writ large. Depression as caused by extremes of psychological stress. So now we've got two very different views. We've got the neurobiology end of it, hormones, brain chemicals, and we've got the experiential cognitive distortion learned helplessness. How do you fit the pieces together? And here you begin to fit them together in an absolutely elegant way that's all built around stress. And what this involves is recognizing that depression is a genetic disorder. 
Depression has a certain degree of heritability to it. Depression runs in families. Oh, environment runs in families also. Much more careful studies showing things like Identical twins have a higher rate of sharing a depressive trait than non-identical twins. Adoption studies, someone who is depressive is more likely to share that trait with their biological parents than with their adoptive parents. There's a genetic component to it. This is not there is genetic determinism. Identical twins, one of them is depressed. There's about a 50% chance that the other one will get depressed also. A genetic fact. One of them has depression, there's a 50% chance that the other one won't get depressed. There's a genetic influence, there's not genetic determinacy. So what are the genes of depression all about? And a few years back, wonderful finding, fascinating one by Avshalom Caspi and colleagues at Duke University, isolating what appears to be one of the most meaningful genes related to depression where you look and you look at large families that have patterns of depression and ones who don't and you look for what genes are common to everybody with the depression and what genes are different from everybody and out popped this one gene that was very interesting because it came with two different flavors, two different variants and one of those variants seemed to be associated with the chemistry of depression. And part of what made people so excited was this gene made perfect sense. It would have been a drag if this turned out to be a gene that has something to do with like how many nostril hairs you have. What was this gene? It coded for the protein that removes serotonin from the synapse and recycles it, the serotonin transporter. And this gave rise to this landmark study looking at humans and looking at which type, which flavor of the serotonin transporter they had, and did this increase your risk of depression. This was a mammoth study focusing on tens of thousands of kids who they then followed for years afterward so that in early adulthood, you knew which ones already had signs of clinical depression, which ones don't, and you have genetically characterized them. So then the critical question of this entire literature, which is, so, if you had the, quote, bad version of the serotonin transporter gene, were you more likely to be clinically depressed? If you had the version that was more likely to produce the serotonin chaos that we now recognize to be central to depression, are you more likely to be clinically depressed? And back came the answer, which was no. Having that version of the gene did not increase your risk in the slightest. So what's going on there? something much more subtle, something much more important. Having this version of the gene doesn't increase your risk of depression unless you also have had a lot of childhood stressors. In other words, an interaction here between early environment experience stress and genetic propensity, and what you see remarkably is for each increase in the childhood traumas, the folks with the good version of the gene have a little bit of an increased risk of depression. The folks with the bad version, it just increases more and more. This is a gene-environment interaction. This is the demonstration of how